gave me a sign, you can hear me? Okay, perfect, then. Okay, then we can start. Uh, nice to have you all here uh, on site and online as well. Um, we're happy to have our workshop um, about online gender violence with you. And I don't really want to say that much. I will just hand over to David, who's our moderator, and he's uh, with us online. So yeah, let's give it up for David. <laughs> Thank you. We can't hear David yet. Uh, David, please wait. We are still trying to get the text so we can hear you. Okay, just to give you <laughs> Also on Zoom a bit feedback, we still can't hear you, so we're still figuring this out and just wait a second and then we can start. Okay, we can hear you now, so you can just start right in. Uh, no, we can't play it. It's um, on a flash that doesn't work apparently on the... Uh, from here, but maybe we can try a screen share. If someone is can make me the host, I can try to do that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try. Should we start with the video? <laughs> oh, what is okay? Let, let me let me just do an, an introduction and then we'll, we'll come to you and we'll we'll, uh, we'll cross the, the the technical bridge when we uh, when we get to it. Um. In the room. In the room. Right, uh, I am CEO of the UK charity SWGFL, a director of the UK Safe Internet Centre, and, and really here representing the European InSafe uh, network alongside my colleagues uh, Sabrina, Sophia, Deborah, and Evangelia uh, as well. So between us, 
Um, we shall be moderating this session both in terms of online and, and Catherine from uh, from the room uh, as well. So we have um, a stellar lineup uh, for everyone uh, too. We will uh, shortly hear from um, uh, Roberta Masola uh, as as long as we can uh, get get the video clip uh, shared. Um, uh, then uh, we will hear as well too from um, uh, from Emmanuel. Um, uh, who has joined us online um, and then we'll turn to Catherine who's actually in the room uh, with you. Uh, Nigat Dad from um, Digital Rights uh, will then uh, give us um, a, a, a contribution uh, and then uh, Cindy Southworth from uh, Meta will give uh, her opening remarks. And so everyone will have sort of five minutes just to set the scene from their particular perspective before we launch into uh, a couple of questions for, for the panel, which which I have. And then we will open it uh, to everyone online and indeed uh, questions from uh, from the room as well. So um, that's the, the, the sort of program and how we're uh, aiming to to present um, this particular uh, session uh, as well. So do please think up some of those questions. Like I say, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing um, uh, panel that we have uh, in this this particular subject, and so in, in terms of the, the the introduction to the workshop, um, so um, all about uh, online gender um, gender violence, um, the good, the bad, and the and the ugly. Uh, so, so just by way of introduction for me, so like I said, I'm, I'm David Wright, I'm uh, chief exec of a charity in the UK, and one of the things and this is really my, my perspective here is since 2015. Uh, we, we launched uh, what is the Revenge Porn Helpline in the UK. Uh, so in that context, uh, we support victims um, of, of victims or adults who are victims of non-consensual intimate image abuse. Uh, and uh, predominantly for, since it started, we disproportionately support um, uh, women um, uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to men. Uh, so just in terms of some of the, the numbers that, uh, that are associated uh, with that. So back in 2019, we have seen an escalator in over the last couple of years, an escalator in terms of calls. So cases in 2019 to totaled some 1,700. That rose to over 3,200 in 2020, rising to over 4,400 in 2021. Last year, we supported 75% of those were indeed uh, cases relating to women. When, um, uh, when we do support men, on average, each case um, uh, contains 0.2 images uh, per case. Uh, but conversely, when we support women, each case uh, on average uh, has a, a significant gender Im imbalance. Uh, and, and so it's based on the team responding and getting content taken down. It's a very practical helpline. Although I would add revenge porn is a terrible title we, we, uh, we which we don't like but it, it endures because that's how we know when people search for the help that we provide the help that the support like that the support service provides that's how that's what people search for and that's how they find us so that's why the title uh, endures non-consensual intimate image abuse is exactly much more descriptive and, and uh, precise around the uh, the particular subject we have just gone through 300 removal of 300 is is equally uh, a um a significant issue that, that we that we deal with from a UK perspective and so we'll get on to hear about an amazing platform stopnci.org which uh, uh, I'm sure Cindy is going to, uh, to to give us some insights to which is uh, launched about a year ago uh, and actually prevents people sharing your your intimate images on, on online but more about that uh, later on. Uh, again it is it is great to see um, uh, perhaps uh, it's, it's taken quite a while, but it's good to see the world wakening to this particular subject as well. We, we've over the course of the last year seen uh, some good progress from a uh, from a policy perspective. We, we saw, which we'll hear shortly from Robota uh, Mansola uh, around um, uh, strategy and direction to do with uh, policy across the European Union. We've seen the White House uh, launch in uh, in June a. Um, uh, oh dear, I've got a, a little bit of a, a, a poor connection. Hopefully it's, it's okay now. We saw the White House launch a task force around gender uh, online violence in June. Uh, we've seen the G7 um, uh, governments uh, uh, have a real focus on, on this particular uh, subject uh, as, as well. 
and, and so that really does introduce us to uh, to the floor to to, to hear from uh, from Roberto. Which uh, 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 Catherine, if I can turn to you now, if you are able to uh, to share um, a, a, the, the the video clip, the, rec the recording that uh, Roberto uh, Roberto has uh, uh, shared with us. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I think we can't hear the sound so far. I try my I try my best to get this uh, started. Um, mm -hmm, okay. more severe cases of right out sustained aggressive online abuse, the more insidious process of name calling and belittling has come to characterize how many experience this call. Okay, I think, okay, we, can I think we can hear her but not see her so far. So um, I don't know how we can fix this, but maybe you can just hear closely and maybe only see the standing picture so we won't be that delayed anymore. <laughs> societal problem. We cannot ignore either that women and girls are disproportionately victimized online. A 2016 United Nations study found that gender-based violence is closely linked to power imbalances between women and Okay, maybe we can just... Oh, wow. Uh, switch off the microphone in front and I just hold my microphone to my laptop and then maybe it will work better if that's somehow fine. No? Because we hear everything a bit doubled. Oh, okay. We, we, we can hear it fine on, online, Catherine. But if oh, okay. it's easy for you in the, in the room, then, uh, then, then, please, then please do so. Okay, I'll just start from the beginning again and then we will see what's happening. <laughs> Many experience, many experience discourse, discourse online. online. We cannot, we cannot ignore, ignore that there is, that there is a, a real modern, modern day societal, societal problem. problem. We, cannot we cannot ignore either that women, that women and girls are disproportionately, are disproportionately victimized online. online. A 2016 United Nations study found that gender-based violence is closely linked to power imbalances between women and men and harmful expressions of masculinities. The scale, the scale of the problem, of the problem is, not is not sufficiently discussed, and therefore, and therefore victims find it, find it very, difficult very difficult to obtain support. To obtain support. Remember, Remember those, those stories of rape victims, victims getting the blame because their skirt, skirt was too short, adding, adding insult, insult to injury, to injury with, with the preposterous suggestion that rape, that rape was the victim's fault. fault. Well, well, the same, the same thing, thing is happening online. online. To give you, to one, give example, you one example, when photos, when photos are leaked without consent, comments such as she shouldn't have got naked in front of the camera persist, putting the blame on the girl. Without addressing, without addressing the real, the real issue, issue a, person a person receiving such, such private content has no right whatsoever to share, to share it with others. others. And, beyond and beyond insult and injury, and injury what, happens what happens then is that victims, is that victims start, start believing, believing this false narrative. narrative. They, blame they blame themselves. And worse, and worse still, still, the negative, the negative backlash, backlash comes from both the victim's male and female, and female peers. peers. We are seeing, we are seeing case, case after case of image-based image sexual abuse across the EU, across the EU particularly, particularly among, among girls and people, and people from the LGBTI, LGBTI community, community who are blackmailed, who are blackmailed bullied, bullied and, tormented and tormented because their private photos, photos and videos are shared, are shared without, their, without permission, their permission, leaving, leaving them little, them little or, no or no recourse. recourse. This is, this is unacceptable. unacceptable. This is when, this is when online, online gender, gender violence, violence becomes a much broader societal issue of discrimination and violation of human rights. The European, the European Parliament, Parliament has always, always called for EU-wide measures, measures to counter violence, to counter violence against, against women and the, and the LGBTIQ community. community. Prevention, Prevention protection, protection and prosecution. And prosecution. Those, are Those are the three main, main elements, elements to counter online, online gender, gender violence. violence. We have welcomed, we have welcomed this year's European Commission's directive proposal that will criminalise, among other, cyber, cyber violence, including non-consensual sharing of intimate images, cyber stalking, cyber, stalking, cyber, cyber harassment, and cyber, and cyber incitement to violence or hatred. Or hatred. And I, am and I am pleased to tell you that the European Parliament, Parliament will be voting on this important piece of legislation in the coming, in the coming weeks. weeks. So, expect so expect change here in the near, in the near future. future.
Finally, Finally, let me express my gratitude to this Internet, internet Governance Forum, forum for, the for the work you are doing to bring, to bring gender, gender equality, equality one step, step further. further. I thank you, I thank for, you for having me. me. Catherine, thank, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you very much, very much um, for, for sharing, that, sharing that. And hopefully, people, people uh, got to, uh, to, uh, see, to see, at least, at least here, 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 here from here from, uh, from Roberta. From Roberta. So, so I, I, should I should have done a full introduction, full introduction in terms of Roberta, Roberta Masola, who is the, who is the president of the European Parliament, Parliament so um, speaks, um, with, speaks great with great authority. authority. Uh, and, and, and it's it's uh, wonderful to have her contribution to this workshop. Really, I think emphasizing the importance. Priority, um, that um, that is applied, that's been applied uh, to this. That's exactly, exactly what I said earlier, earlier on. You know, we're starting to, to see international organisations waking up to, uh, to, to this particular subject, subject as, well. as well. So we thank, so we thank Roberta, Roberta very much, very much for, uh, for, for, that, for that contribution, for that contribution the, opening, the opening opening remarks. remarks. I'm going to turn, going to turn now to Emmanuel. Emmanuel uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, 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 if I can uh, give the floor to you for your opening remarks again, sort of no more than five minutes. That would be wonderful. Emmanuel, the floor is. Uh, is yours. Uh, uh, thank, <laughs> thank you so much, David. David. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good, afternoon. Good, afternoon. good evening. Good evening. Uh, just a uh, short everyone. intervention. Maybe, David, you can stop your screen sharing. Oh, okay, you just did. Yeah. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good, afternoon. good, evening. good evening, everyone. Um, everyone. Um, depending, depending on where, on where you're, you're connecting, connecting from. from. Uh, just, uh, just, just a little bit introduced, I'm called Emmanuel Nikora. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I work for the IT, IT regional, regional office for Africa, Africa. and I'm, and I'm based, based in, 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 in the IT, 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 IT area of West, West Africa, 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 Senegal. Senegal. Uh, thank, uh, you so thank you so much, much uh, for having me. Uh, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Uh, online, uh, online gender, gender virus, uh, becoming, becoming a driver, a driver uh, have become a driver, a driver for, for gender inequality and internet, internet uh, access. access. As we all, As we know, all know, we are increasingly really getting online, and the, and the situation related to COVID-19 has actually further directed us towards the internet and the use of digital tools. There's no doubt, uh, there's no doubt that digital space is significant for women and the girls. Uh, why? Uh, Digital space presents great opportunities for learning and networking. Sadly, the digital space is not quite safe for women and men. Uh, unfortunately, the, the misuse of technology for violence is also becoming uh, our, our reality. In sheer numbers, women and the girls uh, remain disproportionately the primary target for gender-based violence. And digital technologies have actually simplified way known abuse, abusive behaviors such as stalking by pro, uh, providing convenient tools for abusers, uh, since they are, they, they are targets. Unlike the physical virus, which requires people to be in the same place, technology facilitated the virus uh, can happen across geographical locations with abusers being able to access their victims even when they are not in close physical proximity. This, this leads us to a question, is the, internet safe, uh, is the internet a safe place for women? Because women are considerably more likely to be victims of repeated and severe forms of harmful actions online and with the help of technology. Online gender-based violence isolates women in their farms, the patriarchal norms that tend to silence women and girls and they limit their freedom. This in turn extends the gender inequality uh, into all spaces, leaving women with a few places to turn to for support uh, virtually, uh, virtually and in reality. The inventor, the inventor of the internet, uh, Tim uh, Berners Lee, stated in 2020 that the web is not working for women and girls. And according to statistics from uh, Plan International's annual State of the World's Girls Report, which is based on the uh, research conducted across 21 countries with over 13,000 girls and young women, 58% of girls sur surveyed have experienced online harassment. 50% of girls said uh, they face more online harassment 
actually more than street harassment. 42% of girls and young women experience experiencing online harassment reported feeling mental and emotional distress. Of the girls who, who were harassed, 47% were treated with physical or sexual violence. Today, the internet is being used uh, in a broader environment of widespread discrimination and the systematic uh, structure inequalities, which frames women and girls' access to and the use of internet and other ICT tools. To bridge the gender digital divide, all stakeholders need to consider and address online gender violence and safety threats at regional and global levels, according to the areas of responsibility and respective. Combating uh, online gender violence is a collaborative uh, need to, uh, to, to, to have a, a collaborative approach. There's no one single recorder that can address it on its own. On, on. But despite this, this, uh, these discouraging trends, there's more proof uh, than ever uh, that online violence against women and girls is preventable. Evidence shows that the single most important driver of policy change is a strong movement and activism to end the violence against women and the girls, making uh, feminist mobilization in the face of anti-rights backlash. At ITU, uh, the Equals Access Coalition, a global partnership to bridge the digital gender divide, recognizes that why the internet can give women uh, access to information in the life enhancing services and opportunities, online gender-based violence, and the safety concerns around the internet are, are an important driver of gender inequality in access to technologies and the internet. In commemoration of the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women, the members of the Equals Access Coalition, a, red, a coalition led by ITU, have developed a repository of useful resources to address the women and the girls' safety concerns and the bridge the digital gender divide. Those resources can be found online. Secondly, uh, to contribute to the creation of a society that does not tolerate violence against the women, the ITU uh, has launched uh, a child online protection uh, initiative that was, was launched back in November 2008. 2008 as a might as my tie stakeholder effort with the global cybersecurity agenda framework. So this initiative brings together partners from across all global community to promote awareness of child safety in the online world. As a part of this initiative, in 2020, ITU published a set of child online protection guidelines uh, for four groups, children, parents, educators, industry, and the policymakers. In, uh, in September uh, this year, 2022, in partnership with the National Security Authority, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the ITU and partners launch, uh, launched a set of online uh, self-based training on child online protection geared towards the following target groups, parents, educators, policymakers, ICT industry, and children themselves, aged 9 to 12, 13 to 18. ITU has also uh, conducted uh, with partners face-to-face uh, -face training on cybersecurity and the online safety training for the youth uh, aged 15 and 25. We all know that there are also other international efforts to combat this uh, online gender violence. Uh, colleagues, we have, have spoken to that in Budapest Convention and Cybercrime and Istanbul Convention. Uh, just to end my uh, remarks is that at ITU, we, we take this issue seriously and uh, uh, we have uh, efforts such as the, I've, I've already mentioned, uh, Equals effort to provide resources to, uh, that can be used to, uh, to protect against the online uh, gender violence. We have also that uh, child online, uh, uh, child online protection initiative and, and the guidelines and the different trainings and the resources to, to build capacity been developed. So thank you so much for having me and uh, 
back to you, uh, David. Emmanuel, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Yeah, uh, and the great work that the ITU does in this space too. So it's, uh, it's wonderful that uh, we rightly give you the opportunity to share that amazing work, that particularly the Child Island Protection Guidelines from the 2020 uh, revisions that, 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 that we saw. Um, so uh, I'm now going to, Catherine, I'm going to, uh, to hand it over to you actually in the room uh, in uh, at the IGF for, for your uh, opening remarks. Uh, and, and I should add for everyone's benefit as well. So Catherine joins us for representing the youth uh, at IGF uh, too. But Catherine, if you can introduce yourself too, uh, the floor is indeed yours. Sure, I can do that. Uh, you all heard me talking a lot so far, but uh, now it's on the subject, I guess. So uh, David already introduced me. I'm Catherine. I'm from Germany and I've been like a big youth ambassador for some years now, I guess almost 10 years. So uh, still working with a lot of great young people, uh, kind of as maybe a mentor role or something. And um, yeah, I'm really happy that we can do this workshop and that you are all really interested in um, this theme because that's something which is really, yeah, which is really annoying to me because I see online gender violence a lot and um, yeah, it's really frustrating that especially girls are being targeted online just for being young and uh, female. I mean, we have um, all those gender injustices all around like the world in like every part of our living but I think it's especially visible um, online and yeah the sad truth is that that discrimination and hate speech is really um, yeah pushing a lot of young women and girls like out of internet spaces and I guess that's something we want to to tackle and uh, that's because I'm like I'm really looking forward to um, like later hear all maybe your ideas on how to do that and how you I don't know create um, movements and resistance to that to show all the people who are harassing young girls online that um, yeah we won't accept this um, development and yeah so really interesting to seeing and hear you hear from you thanks back to David I guess Catherine, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, and so well, I'm just now going to uh, to pass the floor um, over to Nikat, um, if uh, if you're uh, able to make your contribution, Nikat, uh, uh, the floor okay. is in, if you can please as well introduce your, yourself and the, the, the extraordinary work uh, that, uh, that, that you do. Nikat, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, David. Uh, I hope everyone can uh, hear me. Um, if my connection is patchy, please know I am speaking from Pakistan, where uh, we all, all, all of us do get unequal access to good internet. Uh, but anyways, um, thanks for uh, organizing this uh, uh, panel, David, I think it's uh, the topic has always been very close to my heart. I have been working on online gender based violence for the last one decade. And, um, and um, 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 a lot has been said, uh, why this issue is very important, why it's problematic, how young women and girls around the world have been uh, facing this issue. It's probably very complicated and tricky in uh, conservative societies where uh, women are already uh, facing a lot of oppression and patriarchy in the offline spaces and now the same patriarchy has translated into the online space uh, so uh, uh, i'll be talking about some of the uh, solutions and how we have dealt with the problem um, uh, over the years. And I think, uh, um, and we can talk about challenges as well, but I think for me, it's very important to see how uh, looking at to, looking into different context, how we can sort of uh, address this challenge in our own jurisdictions, in our own context. So in Pakistan, while interacting with young women and girls, uh, uh, so I basically run Digital Rights Foundation, which is an organization working on digital rights. And uh, one of the primary works that we basically do is uh, uh, addressing online gender-based violence. So while interacting with young women and girls uh, for different training se se sessions over the years around digital literacy or online safety, we at our Digital Rights Foundation realized that the 
helplessness that the woman, young woman felt while enduring online harassment. And what uh, made it really more heartbreaking uh, for me and my team was that they felt that they had to go through it alone uh, without any support from their friends and family because of the taboo attached with having an online presence and especially sharing your uh, pictures online or, or, or reclaiming your agency online. So we, uh, as an organization, identified that the major problem is the lack of awareness around the remedies available to them or resources available to them or what are the legal, uh, uh, you know, sort of solutions they have. Uh, so what we did, we decided, and we were so burned out, you know, like uh, looking in, like uh, look, listening to them and really finding no solution. So we decided to take matters in, into our own hands back in 2016 and took an initiative and established the Cyber Harassment Helpline, um, uh, which was the first Pakistan's helpline of its own kind, actually region's first own cyber harassment helpline. Um, and uh, and uh, in fact, at the at the end of that uh, this month, basically tomorrow, we will have uh, completed six years at the helpline. And in this time frame, uh, in in last six years, we have received more than thirteen thousand uh, cases, uh, or from all over Pakistan and some from other countries as well. Uh, because helpline is not on only available on a call; we are available on our on through us social media and through uh, our emails as well. So on average, 68 to 70 percent of the cases we receive uh, are from women, while one person are from trans uh, folks. Uh, that's around 9,000 women who have approached the helpline so far. But because most people find out about the helpline through word of mouth, and there's still a stigma attached with talking about occupying online spaces in our part of the region, the actual number of women who face abuse and harassment online is much bigger in this country. So what what are we actually trying to achieve through the helpline? Um, to actually make women and girls safer more online and, and, and making them more confident and educated about how to protect themselves online. So what are the preventive measures that they can do and telling them what are their rights, uh, you know, uh, uh, when they when their rights rights are breached in the online spaces, we do this by providing digital security uh, knowledge uh, through calls uh, or through trainings, legal advice, and mental health support. Because a lot of women, when they face harassment, there's so much, um, uh, you know, uh, the 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 the. the the toll that it takes on, on their mental health, and they usually do not talk about it. So our aim is to equip them with sufficient knowledge for them to make an informed decision. And uh, again, through the helpline, we are trying to bring to action one possible answer to the question that has been posed to us, which is how we can collectively achieve our responsibility to ensure uh, the equal participation of women and girls in online sa spaces safely and securely, uh, and, and where they assume that their safety is paramount. Uh, but of course, we cannot do this alone. So the important word is to, you know, like how collectively, like we are discussing it here, like multiple stakeholders can take actions, the government, the law enforcement, the judiciary, the lawyers, civil society, academia. Um, uh, so uh, definitely all stakeholders need to be fully involved and committed to this goals. Uh, civil society's helplines cannot do this alone. Um, so, uh, But it is also important for the tech companies, and I'm glad that the Meta, Meta's representative is here uh, to talk about the initiative that they have taken. But it's important for them to also take a responsibility and to keep in mind that what is online violence and abuse for women and girls in one part of the world may not be considered as such in other the parts of the world um and uh, and 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 several companies while working with them we have escalation channels with them uh, uh they now do understand that there is cultural and societal nuances uh, while developing policies and decides deciding enforcement standards um so uh, I, I think uh, uh, it's uh, uh, and talking from experience. This is a problem area there where we are dealing with right now at the helpline is basically, you know, certain intimate images that are uploaded on the Internet with the intention of blackmailing, threatening, ruining the reputation of women in Pakistan. Those images do not necessarily fit the definition of intimate images as outlined by the companies uh, in based in the U.S. or maybe, you know, the, the, the same doesn't apply in Europe or in 
Western democracies. So um, I, I think this is something that we can also unpack in our conversation later. But I really would like to, uh, you know, uh, thank the initiatives like uh, um, uh, Stop NCII uh, 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 dot but also Revenge Porn Helpline. We are not only working in Pakistan, but with the so we, with the co collaboration with these initiatives, we are also uh, trying addressing people who are reaching out to us from those jurisdictions. Um, the, uh, the parent company of Pawn Hub, for instance, instance, has also used the hash technology to detect intimate image abuse and remove videos from their platform. So I think that like, there are in initiatives that are happening and some solutions that are sort of, you know, uh, 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 people are using that according to their own context. But I think this is the larger problem and we need to collectively see how we can address this problem globally, but also, you know, contextually in our own jurisdictions as well. Uh, over to you, David. Megat, uh, thank you uh, ever so much uh, for that. Uh, very powerful, powerful words uh, and so much respect for the work that you and the team do there and have done, as you say, for six years. There are with, what, 13 13,000 uh, cases it is extraordinary work. So uh, we, we we benefit from your insight uh, and, and your leadership in, in this context, too. And, and as you mentioned, as we move on to um, on, on to the next uh, contribution, we, we have the opportunity to hearing from uh, from Cindy uh, from uh, from Meta uh, in terms of the work that uh, both Meta does, but also the extraordinary work that Cindy uh, has done over the course of uh, uh, of, of her career as well. So, uh, Cindy, um, if, if I can uh, hand uh, hand it over to you. Uh, early doors it is in the US at the moment uh, so thank you as much too for, for getting up so early to join yes. us. Absolutely thank you David and it is a pleasure to be here with longtime friends and activists um, they got it's always great to share a panel with you and I, I miss being in person with fellow activists. I um, come to this work as the head of women's safety at Meta but I spent 30 years as a uh, an advocate and activist working to end gender-based violence in local shelters, uh, running helplines, and then working at the, the local, state, national, and then international level. And so I, I speak to you both as a fellow activist um, that is now working inside a company. I believe we should have activists everywhere. They're, they're not limited to one space. Um, and what I want to do just briefly is sort of anchor the work that I do broadly and then talk a little bit about the work that we're doing that um, they got mentioned and referenced and that David is a little bit um, stuck as the facilitator. It's hard for him to talk about Stop NCII as deeply as he might want to because he's he's in facilitator mode. Um, but in my role at on the safety policy team at Meta, I address safety in a, a myriad of, of ways and I come to this having served on the safety advisory board at Facebook, now Meta, for 10 years before I joined the company. And so I saw firsthand some of the work that was happening, and I wanted to become part of that and continue it. And it's fun to actually work on projects that I, I advised on and now I'm responsible for. But the way that we address safety and work to end gender-based violence online and offline is sort of a, a comprehensive approach. And we do it through partnerships with about 850 safety organizations around the world, activists, academics, researchers, NGOs, and about half of those are women's safety, safety partners. We also do it through, um, through policies. And as they got mentioned, we're constantly striving to figure out that right balance to make sure that we have a, one global set of policies, but how do we take in to account the cultural and context and nuance that may differ slightly country to country. So those community standards or policies are the other piece, and I work heavily on those, um, our tools, and that's two different pieces of tools, actually three really. One is user controls, where one of the things we find is what um, I may find offensive or someone else may find offensive may differ based on context. And so I was talking to a para-Olympian, badass swimmer, and she said one of the things people use to attack her is they refer to her, they tell her she should be in the kitchen instead of being this incredible athlete. And they use kitchen emojis in her comments and on her Instagram page. 
obviously as a company, as Meta, we can't ban all mentions of kitchens and all mentions of, you know, uses of food emojis. And, and otherwise, like every time I, I post about what I've made or something I've baked would be problematic. But having like keyword filter, somebody who never wants the, um, the mention of kitchen or food or food emojis can be used through the keyword filter. So those tools can be used in really creative ways when we have creative perpetrators who implement gender-based violence in really unfortunate ways because they get around a lot of our tools. So there's those types of tools. And then there's also machine learning where we're trying to get better and better at identifying hate speech in all the languages and, I, and ideally take it down before anyone even sees it or reports it to us. And we're and we we re, um, report on those metrics in our community standards enforcement report. And you'll see over time that our bullying and harassment is improving, our hate speech is improving. So our proactive reporting and our proactive detection is getting better. Um, in my world, we would never have to wait for someone to report things, but obviously contextual um, offensive are harder for us to catch because we just don't know all the background. So those two different types of tools. And the third that I mentioned is the one that I'll talk about briefly is tools we create in partnership with NGOs such as stopncii.org where somebody can proactively create a hash to prevent their intimate images from being used as a weapon against them. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, the sort of um, fourth bucket is resources. We've created a lot of safety guides with NGO partners around the world to help people navigate our platforms and use all these things I'm talking about. Because having been a victim advocate, it's really hard when you're in crisis to navigate all these resources. And it's important to have them, but it's hard to know which one to use and when. So we're trying to make them more and more intuitive, upsell them at the right point. But then we also do a lot of work with LGBTQ partners, women safety partners, um, and those types of, of groups to make them really intuitive and easy to find. And then lastly, it's our feedback loop. And so it's it's groups and conversations like this one today. We've just recently concluded uh, a series of women's safety roundtables around the world where we talked to over 350 women's safety organizations to hear um, what they like that we're doing and then also where they want us to continue striving, tools they'd like to see us implement, um, policy changes they'd like to see us consider. And so that feedback loop is vital for us to keep the conversation going. And so um, with that, I just briefly wanted to mention Stop NCII because it's coming up on a year anniversary. You'll hear more about that later in this week. Um, but for those that don't know about it, you can report on all the platforms, um, all the tech companies let you pretty much report uh, an intimate image, um, a, a video or um, photo and have it removed. But one of the things that we've heard over and over from NGOs, nonprofits, and survivors is that that doesn't help them rest easy. They can't sleep at night. They're worried they're going to lose their job. They're worried their family's going to see that image. They're, they're really terrified. And so years ago, uh, Meta worked with nonprofits, uh, myself included, when I was in the nonprofit sector to create preventative way to create a, a hash, a digital fingerprint, which is a series of letters and numbers to, pre to prevent an intimate image from being posted on time, Facebook and Instagram. But it was completely run by us, by Facebook. And so the limitations was it was really platform dependent. And so in December of 2021, we partnered with the Southwest Grid for Learning, which runs the UK Revenge Porn Helpline with David and his, his colleagues and launch stopncii.org with the vision that this could be a central hub working with the NGOs all around the world, including the Digital Rights Foundation and so many more of you that are joining today and almost now 80 around the world to make sure that eventually other tech companies would, would be willing to sign on and these hashes could be used by other companies to prevent these intimate images from being used to harm people. So it's a really exciting adventure um, we're hoping um, to see more and more survivors take advantage of this, this tool to prevent intimate images from being weaponized. So I'm, I'm thrilled to join you today and I'm gonna turn it back over to David. Cindy, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and and did Stop NCI proud. Uh, and I'm sure if there are any particular questions, we, we, we can answer, uh, certainly answer some of those. So 
Um, uh, opening remarks uh, or, or complete. Uh, like I said at the outset now, I'm just going to turn back to the panel with, uh, now there are two questions, but actual facts, uh, I'm, actually gonna, I'm going to append one just to keep the panel on its toes uh, and, and see how you, uh, how you react to, to the third question as well. Then we will open the floor um, both uh, physically and virtually. So um, I, I want to, to, to hear um, uh, questions, queries, challenges. Uh, from all of you in the room there, but also virtually on Zoom too. And so, um, uh, Catherine, if you're able to, uh, to to collect, or when when the time comes to collect questions uh, from the room, and equally, Deborah, um, any questions that anyone has uh, online, please do pop those in the uh, in the chat box. We will then get to them. So. Uh, so certainly make a note in the room and or if you can pop in the chat, you know, questions that you want to ask as as they come, as they occur to you, then, uh, then we will get to it uh, in the allotted uh, allotted slot. But uh, I do just have a, a couple of questions that I'm going to, like I say, turn to the uh, turn to the panel um, about um, and really in no no particular uh, no particular order or indeed aimed at anyone in anyone particular. So the, the first question. Uh, which I would like uh, responses uh, from the panel. So women and girls uh, have a right to participate online equally and without fear of abuse or harassment. Uh, we all have a collective responsibility to resolve this. How, um, how do we go about achieving this? Who, um, who's, who's wanting to, uh, to, to respond first to that, uh, that question? Maybe I can start. I don't know how to, to raise the hand that you can see that, David. Okay, Thank so you, <laughs> I think for me there are kind of like three pillars in which this um, could work. As a lawyer, of course, like the third, just first thing always is like law enforcement, you know, to get to the public prosecutors and stuff and all those, um, the whole criminal content being um, enforced. I think that's also something which is uh, working quite well but also I think we have to prevent this from the beginning and I think that's something Cindy already tried to to talk about I mean it's always like the platforms who can help so much by by moderating by moderating the content and um, yeah it's kind of like a lot of stuff is in their power also when we talk about law enforcement to give like the law enforcement the names of the people and the IP addresses and stuff so this has to work together but also of course in in prevention and like the third thing is, I guess we have to empower women and girls. Maybe like a short question to the people I can see in the room. I don't know who of you have been in contact with this, for example, on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, this movement of like this, the perfect woman or the perfect girl. Someone? <laughs> No? Okay, maybe that's just, okay, Joao has been, <laughs> so, may, so maybe it's a thing just in Portugal and Germany, I don't know, but okay, I can quickly explain. So there are like some young women and girls like talking about like their life and yeah, just picturing that they are really perfect, but what they are showing is how they are perfect in, you know, like their looks, what they do in a day, they get up really early in the morning and then they do yoga and do all this great stuff uh, throughout the day. I mean, that's, it's great to do that. <laughs> so don't get me wrong. But I think they like this tends to a lot of young girls, especially that they think they have to, to be like that. And a lot of the stuff which is presented there is kind of, like in the way that like we as young women think we have to to be especially to appeal good to like men and boys so i think that's also a really big problem and if you then get all this negative feedback and all the the hate and the violence online i think this just is yeah those two things go together and that's a really big problem so i guess like the third thing is to empower um, all the, the young women and girls that they uh, give, give a shit about men saying stuff online, I guess. <laughs> Catherine, thank you very much. Those, those three three pillars, as you, as, as you say, kind of really, really important. And you no, know, um, having completed, say completed, uh, started to, uh, to draw some of the uh, um, the various activities that go on across uh, across the world, um, particularly looking at um, uh, violence against women uh, uh, in terms of adults. So there's a lot of 
quite rightly, there's a lot of protection uh, and primary focus uh, often on children. Um, but there's there's often little little provision which uh, that that affords women um, the same sorts of uh, entitlement and right. And so those sort of three pillars: law enforcement, which actually is going to be my third question, Catherine, when when I when I get on to it, as well as the role of industry and empowerment. That you know the pressures that people feel to conform online, um, as you describe it rightly there. Anyone else wish to uh, to respond to that particular question? Um, uh, again, about how we achieve um, uh, how we achieve the, the right uh, to, to participate uh, equally online without fear uh, of abuse or harassment. Yeah, uh, David, I would like to respond to that very quickly. Uh, I think over the years uh, we have uh, realized that it's a uh, since it's a complicated problem so the solution uh, uh, should be multifold you know it uh, it cannot be one solution to this problem um, we really need to encourage uh, local solutions addressing uh, you know different contexts but also uh, global solutions at the bigger scale right and uh, so pushing companies for instance you know the global agenda around this there are governments coming uh, together addressing this there's this one one coalition that has just been formed by US, Canada, and some other countries, specifically addressing online gender-based violence. So I think, you know, uh, uh, governments, tech companies, different stakeholders are realizing that this is an important issue. And I think it's, uh, the, it's the great work of organizations, civil society, uh, activists, people like yourself, helplines like ourselves. There's several people around the world who have been raising this and made it mainstream issue. Um, Political will is something that is so important. I have seen people talking about this locally. Governments are talking about this all the time. But how much resources they are putting into addressing this issue, I think is a major question. Uh, they, 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 there is so much focus on making laws. Yes, we need law. But at the same time, we have seen laws being interpreted in a wrong manner. So making law is not only a solution. How you are actually implementing that law and enabling environment for the law enforcement, for the judges, for lawyers who understand how to interpret that law and enforce it properly. I think that's that's really an important thing that we really need to focus on, that how much countries and, mem and, and member states, uh, because it's UNIGF, so member states are willing to invest into this issue is a ma major question for me. Um, Capacity building of judges is very important. Law is there, but then they don't really know how to, you know, interpret that law in a progressive manner. The laws, uh, and we have examples, living examples of such laws which are enacted in the name of protecting young women and girls in the online space. But the same law has been misused and weaponized against people against activists, journalists. So I think we, we need to be very careful when we are looking into solutions. Are we looking at the both sides of the solutions that how these can be weaponized and how how much willingness is there uh, uh, from the stakeholders? And I'll add to it, uh, I'll respond to your other questions as well later, but this political will for me is the most pertinent and important thing at the moment. David, can I jump in on that? Of course, Cindy, please do. As a as someone who ran a nonprofit for 30 years, I um I just want to say to anyone from a government, if you are um speaking about how important these issues are and you are not prioritizing the funding of civil society to address online gender-based violence, you are failing. Um I desperately worried about how I was going to keep the projects that I was running and this incredible staff that worked at the National Network to End Domestic Violence employed to keep doing vital life-saving work. And I know Nigat and all the other civil society folks that are on this panel that are that are joining us today struggle every day with how do you keep the lights on and keep doing this work. And at Meta, we fund NGOs, but Governments have to step up and also fund them. It's not just about changing the laws. You have to fund civil society. Civil society does not function if there are not funds coming in to keep them alive and keep them going. And so I, I call to tech companies to keep funding them, but I call to foundations and to governments just to step up. Um, it's It takes all of us to make this happen. 
Um, and I, I see a lot of exciting movement right now of, of the, the online alliances coming together and talking about how we need data. There is phenomenal data. There has been so much research over the years, so much really good, solid research. We know what happens around online and in-person gender-based violence. So instead of spending that time and money on research, let's spend that time on funding civil society who have proven evidence-based solutions that just need funding to continue. Um, and then if you're okay, I've got a question in the chat that I can pivot to that's on the same note around sexism and misogyny. Is that okay, David? Uh, yes, please, Cindy. Um, and I just couldn't answer it in the chat. It's, it's it's really hard to like take down the patriarchy in a chat box. Um, I, if, I, if I could, I would. Um, I'm just not that skillful at six in the morning um, Eastern time. Um, but the, the question is, what are we doing as, as a company to deal with sexism and misogyny on the platform? And one of the things that I was really excited about the opportunity to join Meta in my role is in addition to all the, the tools and levers and policies that I talked about at the beginning, is really one of the opportunities I was excited was how can we use our platform to do major social change? And one of the reasons we know that violence against women exists in the world and all of the isms exist is they exist because they are allowed. They just sort of inherently um, continue and they are perpetuated because they are not interrupted. And one of the ways you change social norms is to, to interrupt them and stop them and cause people to have an aha moment. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is we did some internal research and we saw that when you popped up, or we pop up a message to people when they are writing something offensive and we say to people what you are, are typing, this comment has, has been considered offensive and may cause harm, 50% of the time when people saw that message, they either edited their comment or they deleted it. And like, that doesn't seem snazzy on like a social change standpoint, but that's interrupting behavior and causing people to stand back, take a moment, take a breath, think, and change their behavior. My internal social justice warrior is like, whoa, okay, we're doing something here. We're causing people to change their behavior. So for me, that gets me excited and I want to do more of those types of things. Cindy, thank you very much, and hopefully uh, uh, a, a, a great response to, uh, to, to to the question as well. And it does actually make me uh, make make me think. I'm going to go off um, off a tangent just for a moment. And, and so, as, as you say, uh, Sydney, a lot of research in this particular area. It makes me think of a, a review that occurred in the UK, uh, which the schools inspectorate was who was commissioned by the government in the UK. To, uh, to undertake a review of sexual abuse um, uh, and sexual harassment in, uh, in schools. Um, and it follows the publication of a website, Everyone's Invited, which, in, which um, invited um, particularly children to post what they refer to as anonymous testimonies, uh, citing um, the, the, the abuse uh, and the harassment that they experienced, again, often citing the school, the university where that took place. And I mean, in its two years of operation, it today hosts some 50,000 testimonies describing that abuse or harassment that children, particularly girls, experience, uh, and, and quite a lot of it online. That's what the Ofsted concluded, too, of a survey of 1,000 uh, children in the UK. They concluded that uh, children find uh, sexual abuse and sexual harassment, quote, commonplace and normal. 90% uh, of girls routinely receive unwanted sexual images. 74% uh, of girls routinely receiving requests for intimate images. Um, and, and so it, it is uh, so normal and so common that they don't actually do anything about it. They merely just endure it. It's a, a cultural issue that, uh, that, that we face. So I think that too encapsulates some of those those points, Cindy, that, that, that you make that you make too. And it's how we change that, uh, that culture. Emmanuel, if I can come to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, I, would, I would also like to contribute to this very complex, I uh, think, topic. Uh, looking in the perspective of Africa, uh, this agenda, on agenda violence uh, comes to add to already existing uh, agenda based violences that we we see around the, around Africa that are also not addressed at the moment. And uh, I was uh, uh, thinking of how can we this uh, this can be done. Of course. Uh, 
at, at international um, organization level and other stakeholders we try to do as much as we can i think i would like to stress on the on the on the on the importance the importance of, of that has been also mentioned on capacity building capacity and the skills of of, of girls and, and and the women to to protect themselves uh, because we know uh, there are also other issues of culture, a cultural aspect that comes in uh, in our societies, uh, mostly uh, especially in Africa, where the guys that are already they are already women, they are already uh, experiencing other forms of gender violence that are already not addressed uh, at the moment. And then adding also the complexity of online, uh, and we 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 don't see really much being done in terms of uh, capacity. You know, even the governments have limited the capacity in terms of technology to uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, protect uh, the uh, this uh, gender or non gender violence. Uh, limited the capacity is, is there. So I think we, we are we are, what we are doing at ITO is to uh, come up with the guidelines, but also training uh, uh, stress on the training uh, uh, the guys and the women, uh, stressing the, the importance of privacy and safety online. So young women and the girls uh, must be educated on how to protect their privacy and ensure that they, they have uh, they were developed uh, security protocols in pre to protect their information and, and uh, account access. They should be capacitated uh, to understand really the cyber hygiene, uh, which are a set of uh, practices, organizations and individuals perform regularly to maintain the integrity and, and, and the safety of, of users as to make sure that they, they, they have the capacity to protect themselves uh, because because of other issues, again, reporting the cases sometimes becomes uh, an issue. And we know the limited capacity of our, some of our government that you know, they, are not, they don't have the capacity to go after this uh, violence if there's no, there's no one that reported because you need to report uh, uh, then uh, the, the problem can be pursued then these guys, they need to be trained. Uh, they also should also be at, at, at somehow actual change. So they, they need to understand that they need to report these issues when they, so that at least uh, something can be done. Because I don't see really uh, governments, because they have the law enforcement in our African context, they have so much to deal with. Um, so that if they, there's no a report that comes and then someone reports, it's very hard for them to go after uh, uh, those abuses that are happening online, just not because they don't want to, but because they have so many uh, dealing with. So that brings me to the issue, uh, to the, uh, again, the, the, uh, the, the important aspect of the country's uh, government creating, uh, uh, establishing, uh, uh, setting up uh, uh, regulator, regulatory uh, bodies, uh, reg uh, regulations that setting uh, like, uh, like an organization, a separate organization that's going to ensure that these issues are, 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 are addressed. So there's not really one one uh, stakeholder that I can say that can address this complex issue. And uh, and and in the context of Africa, where we we are seeing a lot of uh, things happening. And the government having so many uh, priorities. Yes, we talk about it in different conferences. We insist on doing uh, on on really uh, giving this uh, issue a uh, uh, priority because now, with the, especially with after the COVID, much of much is being done online. Uh, studies, uh, running, and work is being done online. So that that's where uh, the, the the violences are are, are, are taking place focusing again on, 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 on women and, and girls. So there's no one solution for this, but I think I would like to, to we need to emphasize on all stakeholders contributing to this, doing whatever you can in terms of capacity building, uh, working with the government to put in place uh, the policies, uh, uh, support the countries to, to implement the, guard, the, the guidelines, working with, with the countries with, and other partners to work to, to together uh, to uh, bring this uh, challenge on, uh, on 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 a high table of discussion because uh, in the context of Africa, uh, this is a new I can say it's a new it's a new trend because we already have uh, a lot of gender-based violences happening in our societies in the physical world that goes that go unaddressed and attended because again cultural uh, 
dimensions, cultural perspectives, also limiting the capacities of, of, of some of our governments, and, and a lot of, of uh, intersection of, 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 of issues that makes even the physical gender violence unaddressed. Now we are adding online uh, gender-based violence that then the government don't have uh, a capacity, uh, technological uh, capacity. So the important the importance of working with the civil society and other competent uh, organizations, I think, is very uh, is very important. But I think the, the 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 steps are being taken like the forum like this. Now we are discussing about the issue, and the, some of the this issue are, are also affecting the women from underdeveloped uh, countries, who are communities. Those are the high target of this gender violence because they don't have even the skills, the capacity to even report it to due to other challenging aspects. So uh, thank you for 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 bringing this uh, to the uh, on the agenda of the IGF, I think it's very important to talk about it. And every organization at IT are taking this seriously. Uh, well, uh, so much is being done on protecting the child by edic uh, by uh, training educators, training uh, uh, parents, uh, and and also uh, training uh, focusing on on, on girls and, and and young 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 women that uh, uh, are being stated to to know how to protect themselves, but also uh, play a part because we need to support also our, our, our government uh, to address these issues. Thank you so much, but uh, I, it's a collective uh, approach to, to go against this uh, very uh, serious uh, online gender violence issue. Thank you. Emmanuel, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much um, for, for, for that um, re really important re reminder. I'm really keen, though, to uh, we, are, we are a few minutes over and keen to open the floor to uh, give everyone the opportunity, particularly Catherine, th those um, in the room and also Deborah, if there's any more questions uh, online that we have, too. So um, if, I, if perhaps Catherine, if I turn to you First, if there are any particular questions or challenges or comments that we have uh, have from the floor in the room there. Yeah, sure. Just give me a sign if you want to say something. Oh, okay. A lot of people. So maybe we start in front. Elisabeth. Thank you. I hope you can hear me well. This is Elisabeth Schauermann speaking from the German Informatics Society. So I am coming from the point of view of a research-oriented non-profit. And I want to come back to the point of... There is enough research data available. We don't need more. We don't need to open up potentially more technical data. And I would like to challenge that because I agree we know the extent of the problem, probably. Um, but uh, the extent of the problem, data on that will only get us so far in terms of awareness raising, which is important, I agree. But uh, when we think about uh, solutions, also coming from a technical point of view, I think uh, civil society organizations are very interested in co-developing also um, technical solutions or at least frameworks that then really rely on being able to access more in-depth um, data, research data uh, and platform data. So, um, yeah, it's less of a question or <laughs> a statement, but I hope uh, we can have a discussion on that. Um, th th thank you, thank you very much. Are there any particular uh, comments or observations? Any response? Okay. Um, if there's anyone from the floor that wishes to respond on that one as well. Okay, I don't see someone here who wants to respond, maybe from the panel. Okay, yeah. Right next to Elizabeth. <laughs> um, hello, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. So I, I listened to you and uh, I'll say I quite agree with you. But then uh, looking at it from another perspective, uh, tackling gender-based uh, violence online, when it comes to the perspective of artificial intelligence, uh, I, I'm not, I, do not believe, I do not belong to the school of thought that we have enough data to train models that actually fight these things in an automated way. So. I believe that AI has the potential to tackle this issue. We most likely need to generate more data to train models that can adequately, with very minimal human supervision, tackle gender-based violence online. So it's a two-way thing. 
depending on your perspective you're looking at it from. But that's just what I think about generating more data concerning this. Thank you. So yeah, the the, the need for more data to uh, to train some of the emerging kind of AI models that might be able to identify to 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 prevent or identify and potentially pre prevent uh, as well. Uh, a, a good point, good contribution. A any other particular questions or comments? Yes, there were some more raised hands in the room, but maybe first, Please does do, someone Catherine. want to also answer to that or we can go on with like the next question? Okay, I saw there were some raised hands in the room. Maybe you can just raise your hand quickly again. Okay, yeah, then we start there. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kito Shilongo. I'm from an organization called Research ICT Africa. I just um, thank you very much for the conversation, and I especially appreciated um, Emmanuel's um, comments about um, our patriarchal societies and the um, very sexist and misogyn misogynistic um, society that we ha we live in but i was also i'm also very concerned about the w the language that we use and i think that's a very important part of um proactive policy making and throughout this whole conversation we've been talking about women and girls and empowering women and girls and the problem are the perp perpetrators of um um gender based violence and who are statistics say that they are predominantly men but when we talk about um gender based violence whether it's online and offline we we almost normalize men as perpetrators by not speaking about those stats. And I know it's, it seems, um, I live in Namibia, and it's very, when people talk about this, it's very like, almost like it's very harsh. You know, it's, it's easier to save the woman, you know, let's empower women, but maybe capacitate men to not be violent. And, and we normalizing male violence um, furthers this problem by, you know, that, that we women as well, we, we think it's normal. There's nothing we can do about it, but it's not normal. Um, I mean, Catherine, I have to agree, unfortunately, about you know saying that this this perfect woman and 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 I think it's let's leave women alone. You know, if if it's 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 not good that there's you know that they want to ignore and have this like you know image. But I think um, women who are trying to and I think they live. This is how they survive under a patriarchal, sexist, misogynistic society. It's a response. They're just trying to protect themselves, and people who abuse them and saying that oh we should you know empower women and say don't be a, a perfect woman. It's kind of saying that um, why are you? It's victim blaming in a way. Like you're getting those comments because you're having this view, and so. Yeah, essentially, I just want to say that the language that we use around uh, violence and perpetrators should change, and we should be talking about like where does this, this come from, and how then. And I think that will form or inform the kind of like devices that we use um, to respond to violence. Thank you. Thank you. I think you made like a really interesting point because what you just said that we victimize young girls and um, women. I think that's something that also happens like in the offline world, like if, you know, like a woman gets raped, they're always like, okay, what did she wear really short skirt? It's like her fault. And I think the same is like happening uh, online when people say, yeah, she just shouldn't have sent those pictures, then he couldn't post it. And I think it would be kind of interesting, maybe someone from the room or online has ideas on how to address this to men, what you just said, that we also have to work with them, that um, we don't only um, yeah, work with women and empower them, but also um, yeah, show, show the pe perpetrators or the potential perpetrators that um, yeah, it uh, could suck what they maybe could do <laughs> in the future. So um, are there any like programs um, so far? Does anyone from you know something about this? Because I only know, know from like Germany, there are always, we are always trying to, you know, if people are like they are law enforcement and then it goes to court and they try to after that they try to bring them into projects so they don't um, start this again but i think it would be interesting to maybe know some more about this before this um, happens if there are any projects because i'm not familiar with any as we so nigga has a as hand which presumably nigga is in response to the, the comment that was just made yeah, I mean, uh, it's um, um, just adding to what 
uh, what Geet said, basically, uh, I think the language is really a problem. And uh, even when we do trainings uh, in Pakistan, uh, there's all this, oh, tell women how to say, how to secure them online. Honesty, it's uh, women are exhausted. You know, it's like it's a lot of labor on their part and on our part to tell them how to be safe online. Where this, you know, like uh, uh, the the your constitution and the democracy and the society actually, you know, it should be safer for everyone, right? It's why gender has to make an extra effort to be safe online and offline. At the same time, you know. Um, uh, uh, we unfortunately you know like they we, they take this burden and we have to take this burden to kind of tell them that you, you know that this is like not really enabling environment for them especially close societies so you know what are the things that they do but definitely i agree that we really need to change you know look into the language that we use also the burden that we are putting on women more that while they are being traumatized and you know like face violence in the online space and offline space at the same time it's the, it's the burden on them to be safer you know and do and learn all the preventive measures uh, and you know like to to address the abuse that they face. but at the same time initially i just would like to share Initially, I started work, when I started working. I only started doing uh, training with women uh, because I also feel safe for them. Uh, uh, and 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 starting this in in you know conversation around online violence, where this is like still a taboo. Talking about your you know intimate pictures being being leaked or you know being weaponized against you uh it's 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 a stigma and uh and they are they were unable to share their stories you know even with a group of women so including men in this which they think is really not safe where you supported you know the 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 perpetrator of violence are there uh, they you know uh, were not able to share their, you know stories so i think it's important for us to create those spaces for them so that at least they share their version of you know like uh, stories and you know what face online and now we now i think after 12 years we have spaces where men and women are part of those spaces and women are talking you know who they who they are facing this violence from and it's coming from everywhere major men and that's truth and we cannot really deny it so uh, and and then there are men who are really an ally and they are there how to address so you know you really need honest allies uh, who are there to become, you know, who champion the cause, but also not hijacking the cause. So I just, I'm just like, you know, like talking as a feminist where, you know, like it's a trick subject, but at the same time, you come as an ally and support, to support us. But also this is the narrative, this is the ownership and agency of our own story. So you try to see how you can make things easier for us, but also champion the cause. Oh, negative. Uh... We feel your, your your energy and your passion kind of come through, uh, come down th through the internet, and I'm sure that's felt equally in the room as well. So, um, some some really really important points. It does remind me as well. So, from a UK perspective, I'm sure you but you, you said it earlier on. We do spend a lot of time coaching those people who uh, who, who reach out for our support uh, in terms of they've contacted the police and the police told them why did you take the images in the first place, and you know clearly that's the problem is. Uh, is one with an offence, and this is how you should report it, or indeed this is how they should, um, and how they should process that that offence. Particularly, it's clear to move on uh, to. Um, I've been very patient, um, uh, so if I can give the uh, give the floor to you, ask your your question too, please. Thank you. First, you'll need to unmute. Am I audible? Hello. You are. That's Hello. good. Thank Hello. you. The floor is yours. One of our one of our women are like to ask a question, please. Hello. Assalamualaikum. I'm from Bangladesh. My name is Tatnya Tanjim Jyoti. Uh, 
I want to say that uh, in Bangladesh, most of the women are digitally illiterate. Uh, they don't know what is the uh, gender based violence in cyberspace. Uh, it will be easier for us if the IGF content uh, provide their content in our mother tongue, basically. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, we, it will be very helpful for us. Please do something. Yeah. Okay. I think I, th I think this is a very important question. Maybe Cindy would like to respond to this, but this is basically, you know, like talking about the uh, making the content available in the regional languages and local languages. And I think that's what we have been as an oversight board pushing matter to make the content available in local languages where, you know, like the question is really coming from the ground where they're like, we do not understand, you know, English is not our language, right? So if we have like a content in Bengali, the woman would really, or anyone on the platform would understand how the reporting mechanism work, what community guidelines are saying, you know. So, so I think it's basically how much uh, how much effort and resources platforms and tech companies are putting into you know uh, into local languages and making the content available in a in a way where you know people actually understand what these companies are saying in their reporting me mechanisms and community guidelines. Um, okay, thank you very much. Cindy, would you care to offer responses? Perhaps a little un unfair, because I personally know how much effort that you go to um, uh, around this this subject, but clearly there's always more that uh, that can be done uh, around around languages. But uh, Cindy, any any response you wish to, uh, to, to offer? Well, this is sort of a tag team because we're working on the translations with you in partnership, but uh, stopncii.org is currently in Bengali and uh, we're adding additional languages in partnership with Southwest Grid for Learning. It's actually being translated right now this week um, uh, for Cambodia. Uh, it's in approximately 20 languages right now and the David and his team are adding additional languages as we speak. Um, in Meta, I can speak to like facebook.com slash safety. The Women's Safety Hub is in over 55 languages and we're continuing to add because we agree. I mean, it, it, things need to be in local languages and that's not just language capacity, it's also cultural context. So one of the things that we're doing uh, with uh, all the materials that are for uh, Thursday, December 1st, the anniversary celebration that David and I mentioned for Stop NCII's one year anniversary is things are being reviewed in by native speakers because it's not just, are they technically accurate? It's how do you talk about intimate image abuse if you don't work in the NGO sector or understand these concepts? It, they're really, really complicated concepts. and translator may not get it just right. So we're having additional people look at um, these issues. And then we know that the NGOs who bring additional expertise around gender-based violence will also look at those materials. But I, I completely agree. It's just something that we're always striving to do more of and do better. And we also get feedback from partners like yourselves. If you see something, you say you got it wrong, please let us know and we will make a correction because um, language is nuanced. Yeah, absolutely right. I, th I think it, uh, it, it reminded um, it reminded me the the Stop NCII NGO network, which Cindy said we is nearly eighty organisations, and these are organisations working to support women, particularly around online harassment and online abuse to do with with NCII. Um, so eighty organisations from across the world. We met uh, a couple of weeks ago. I should add, if there are any any organisation here, be it online or in the room, that does work supporting. Um, adults, but you know, particularly women uh, around NCII, we would really, really love to hear from you. So just there's a there's a link on the on the website. We're trying to build that network uh, all the time. And it was folks we heard from, uh, from Paraguay, from Latin America, which reminded us exactly that point only two weeks ago around the importance of this, the accessibility of, uh, of that information in languages. It uh, Stop NCI, for example, doesn't really mean much um, uh, in Spanish. For example, and you know, for, for the European network, we see that, haven't we, for two decades now? The importance of the importance of language. Yes, we had one more question in the room. You can go. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm Sophia Longwe. I'm a German youth delegate, and I was also involved in civil society activism for quite some time, which also led to me getting harassed online quite often, which was then also gendered and racialized. And I do agree with your point. It was really important that you raised that. Why should we focus on women and girls? Like, empowerment is important, and it's really important to create safer spaces and to really, like, empower women. But in the end, what is more effective, focusing on female disadvantage or on male privilege that is clearly there? And I believe that it's way more effective to focus on the privileged side because it's the like kind of superior part where men do not have this extra burden. For example, if they go into politics, that they actually have to um, yeah, go through all of this online. And victimizing girls for me and from my point of view is really not proactive. It is just simply emotional labor. So in that sense, everyone really needs to be involved in this conversation. And why shouldn't we educate privileged people about their privilege and then prevent perpetrators from actually harassing? And then I think I couldn't leave this session without mentioning intersectionality in a gender sense, because intersectionality is essential in this conversation. Online violence is also racialized. Indigenous, for example, being indigenous also plays a role. Having a queer identity disabilities, neurodiversity, the level of income matters, and also when looking at law enforcement, and then also just statelessness migration, such levels are also really, really important to bring into that. So my question would be, um, yeah, in the government capacity, but also in the industry, who has the power to actually man moderate those conversations and who has the power to enforce this? And just as a comment to Cindy regarding Facebook and Meta and the languages, 55 languages for our world is not enough. Like we have made way more, I think like 6,500 or something. So I think it's time to really invest into inclusivity there. Thank you. Sophia, I think you, uh, you, you, you hit, the, hit a, a, a good spot there in terms of the, the, the support and the, the, uh, the, the, the comments, the supportive comments to, uh, to, to, your, to your particular um, contribution uh, as well. Uh, we only have uh, two minutes remaining. Um, and so before, um, this is going to be a little unfair to give uh, to any burning questions that in the room or, or in the now what to ask that um, all important we had question. one question david online but it's been already advised it was about um and the person uh, um in the chat asked uh, about uh, whether if how difficult would it a ground in the image or, or through other means and Cindy answered that if an image is altered it may need a new hash so we en they encourage people to create hashes of all copies of images even ones that are subtly different since they will create different hashes that was mainly um, uh, what was being said on the chat and one particular participant in the chat also um, told us that she's doing her PhD on misogyny, and uh, if anyone would like to contact her, she, she has left her contact details. And let me see if there's something else. I think that's all from, from the chat. Thank you, Deborah. Um, that's awful, awfully kind and also to get through too, which just leaves me with, with perhaps a bit or two. I will just. Or two, if you wish to summarize, like Emmanuel, I can come to you first. Thank you, David. Let me just to what we just connected uh, are the creators. Uh, so, not like the, all the men are doing online, of big enough of men like this that are ready and they're ready to support this movement. Uh, Everything the online gender violence and the women and guys that I know that are being uh, our sisters, our our, uh, our 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 a big number of men are available and ready to the movement. We know that this is an issue, and that we are there to to, to support you. And we know the, the challenges also that are there. Out there. Uh, it's an issue that's not really discussed, discussed enough, especially in Africa, due to our culture, our, our backgrounds. But 
this is a time now to work together and make sure this is uh, this is these things we cannot have it really continue to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. The room summarized by others. Uh, I think uh, if we start even not assisters with humans, as enjoined in our constitutions and UN declarations. Thank you, Nigat. How to summarize a life's work uh, all in one sentence. Uh, uh, Cindy, uh, if, if I can to you to. It's great to be. Cindy, uh, it, it, it's been an immense pleasure. Um, just comments or indeed from the room? Uh, yes, I try to give my best. <laughs> so um, we talked a lot about women online, and I think as long as women and uh, children or girls are um, online, we are exposed to harassment and violence, especially if, like Sophia said, you're politically outspoken or you identify as LGBTQIA plus person or, um, I don't know, you have a disability or whatever, then you are really, um, uh, you can be attacked really easily. And I think we should really um, change that. And I hope maybe that um, all of you who are like in the room, if you want to continue this um, conversation with all of the other speakers, I can certainly give you, I don't know, contacts and whatever, or yeah, help you um, trying to get to them if you want. Catherine, that's, um, that, that, that would be wonderful if you can kind of, yes, continue that, that conversation on as well. I, I really thank you for, for holding the room. Deborah, thank you for, uh, for organizing the, or moderating the online chat. To also Sabrina, Sophia, uh, and, and Evangelia, too, on behalf of the network, I couldn't not uh, mention Safer Internet Day, 7th of February 2023, uh, which is the purpose. And for the last 10 years, we've been engaging and working with um, with, with the IJ. Again, uh, physically with that uh, next year, too. So 7th of February, Safer Internet Day. It's been my pleasure, indeed, my privilege uh, to be able to do uh, this. As you say, we have a lot of work to do. There is a lot of work to do, but with those kind of insights we've heard, you know, I feel massively enthused and inspired to take the those. Thank you for your participation, both online and in the room. Uh, I know we all are very good. Thank you. So for those who are staying in the room, next we'll have um, working session 214, blurred lines between fact and fiction, disinformation online. So if you want to stick around.